All right, so this is obviously this the meet meet everybody kind of panel. Not really, you know. We're gonna just talk about a little bit how they who they are, how they are into this thing, and then a little discussion about what they're passionate about. So I will start on the end with mo uh, most of my new guests this year, other than some of the people on this panel, are actually brand new, never been to Dragon Con before. I think you've never been to Dragon Con, and that'd be uh, Ron, right? Yep, Aaron. Yeah, right, or Aaron. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit. Okay. Uh, I'm Aaron Ra, um, author of Foundational Falsehoods Creationism. Just got this out of the box this morning. I have some up against the back wall. I am president of Atheist Alliance of America, and I'm director of the Phylogeny Explorer Project, which is yet to be unveiled, but when it will be, it'll be a, uh, a phylogenetic hub, uh, and we're, we're trying to make the a, a rendering online of the complete phylogenetic tree as a encyclopedia of life forms. And that's me. Very cool. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Julian Mussolino. I'm an academic, actually, a professor of uh, psychology and cognitive science at Rutgers University. I'm also the author of The Soul Fallacy, a book that came out about a year ago, and I'll be talking about this on Sunday morning at 10, so I hope there'll be a lot of people. Uh, I'm, this is my first Dragon Con, so I'm very excited. Uh, you haven't seen anything yet, by the way. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I'm I'll tell not you even what, kidding. When, uh, <laughs> when I landed at the airport last night, there was a big banner in the airport yeah. advertising Dragon Con, so I knew that this was something, uh, something big. Um, so I'm super happy to be here, and I'm looking forward to all the events, to the parade uh, on Saturday morning, uh, the costumes, and uh, interacting with the other uh, people uh, in the crowd. And good morning, everyone. My name is Margaret Downey. I'm the founder and president of the Free Thought Society. Uh, we are a um, national group. Uh, we're doing events all over the country. Uh, but I am always thrilled to be at Dragon Con. This is my seventh Dragon Con, uh, thanks to Derek's kind invitation. That's all of them but one. Yeah, <laughs> all of them but one. And um, I asked Dragon. I asked Derek um, Not about. A I, I, he's the dragon master, actually. Like the, the grand no, dragon. No, 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 no not, not the grand dragon. Not, no, not a So I asked Derek a couple of years ago, uh, why aren't the skeptics in the parade? And he said, well, I don't have any time. And I said, well, it's so important to be in the parade <laughs> that I said, OK, I'll do it. Because um, I love costumes, and I love to work with people. And I think it's so important for skeptics to be out in the public with our message of education and science and um, claims against the, the uh, alternatives to um, claims of the paranormal and, and all those things need to be um, out in society, out in front. We need to be in that parade. And I'm so proud every year that it keeps getting better and better. Um, and, and this year, we're televised. And actually. I'll tell you more about um, the parade when I have more time, but right now we're introducing ourselves, so I'm going to pass it on <laughs> to my friend Dan. <laughs> I'm Dan Barker, and this is my first Dragon Con, and I'm here. I'm only here because Margaret said, you got to come here. So <laughs> <laughs> I only had heard a little bit about Dragon Con, but uh, this will be a lot of fun. I am co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, Madison, Wisconsin, co-host of Free Thought Radio. We had to record our show early this week for our Saturday broadcast. Uh, I've written some books, um, uh, Godless, How an Evangelical Preacher Became One of America's Leading Atheists, which is my story. It's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> we all have our embarrassing pasts. Uh, the book, uh, Life Driven Purpose, which answers Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life. A book that came out this year called God, the Most Unpleasant Character in All Fiction which Richard Dawkins asked me to write because he wanted to defend his famous sentence. And I'm going to talk about that tomorrow uh, in a panel, the most unpleasant character in all fiction. I'm also co-founder of the Clergy Project, which are ministers and priests and nuns and other uh, professional clergy who are now atheists and agnostics and need an exit strategy. So we're helping them get out of the pulpit. And next month in our convention in um, Pittsburgh, one of the preachers who's still in the pulpit right now is going to come out as an atheist. Uh, he's registered under a false name so nobody knows. So if you come to our convention in Pittsburgh, you'll get to see one of them. He's quitting his job in a couple of weeks and he's going to come out as an atheist. Wow. So that'll be fun. Exciting. Wow. <laughs> what, what time is your panel tomorrow? 
5.30, I think. It's in this room, I think. Yep. Everything for Dragon, for Skeptic Track this year is actually in the same hotel. And even all but one event is the same floor, because even our big magic show is actually just right out here, right, right across from the new tables we have, which I will tell you about in a moment. New tables? Yeah, it's, you're involved with this, so you oh. can talk. <laughs> um, First she heard about it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Leanne Lord. Um, I, I'm, I'm sensing a theme. I'm, I'm too here. I'm also here because Margaret said so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Without Margaret, obviously, I don't have a track. <laughs> okay, I didn't say it, but it applies to me, too. <laughs> I, I, was too. I was the first, so I didn't want to say it. <laughs> No, and, and, and it's, uh, it's wonderful. Um, I, actually, thank you both, Derek and Margaret. This is my, my second Dragon Con. Um, yes, I'm so, I'm excited for many reasons. Second Dragon Con, it's my birthday. I don't know why I'm oh, yeah, so excited. Yeah, it, it, it is your birthday. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot the cake. <laughs> so this is like the best birthday weekend ever for me. <laughs> I, I, I haven't stopped smiling yet. You're in your 30s now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, not a day over 22. Uh, <laughs> So now you can just use DragonCon as your birthday, so that means you're only two. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Drunken toddler! <laughs> Terrible twos. Terrible twos, yes. It'll make your comedy so much better now. It will. And speaking of comedy, uh, I have my show tonight um, at 10 p.m., uh, so please come. Uh, he hasn't introduced yet, but he will also be with me. He's like, I'm on your show tonight? I'm like, yeah, you're on my show tonight. <laughs> You'll be there. Um, I also uh, am an author. Um, I have a book called Dict Jokes, that is D-I-C-T. Yes, it, nothing to do with skepticism, but really funny for skeptics, if you like it. And my second book, which just came out this year, uh, Real Women Do It Standing Up, <laughs> which is a collection of stories uh, a la Irma Bombeck meets David Sedaris about my life as a woman, black female stand-up comic, trying to be a comic, trying to be a human being, trying to be uh, a wife and failing, because I'm single now. Uh, but it's, yes, it's all of those life stories uh, sort Dealing of rolled in. Parents. What was that? Dealing with smelly parents. Dealing with smelly parents. Yes, I also have a podcast, because I don't have enough to do. I have a podcast now called People with Parents. Because um, our parents, our relationship with our parents is like the longest one, most complicated one we have, and no one ever tells us or teaches us how to manage that as they get older. And that's where I am, trying to deal with it uh, with love and humor, and I put them on Groupon if <laughs> anyone's interested. They're very cute old people. Um, they love strangers, so I encourage them to go with strangers as often as possible. They always get brought back. They always get brought back. Are you, are you sure these are your parents are not dogs? Dude, if, you know what? No, if they were dogs, they'd behave better. They, <laughs> <laughs> they would do what they're told, uh, who listens to the kid. Um, so yes, um, Leanne Lord, comedy show tonight, 10 o'clock. I'm sure there are other panels that someone has said that I'm on that I don't know right now. Science but, Track poaches yeah. you for things. Yes, yeah, science. Look at the back I'm also of on Science Track. I, I would read the back of my ID, but the, I don't know what happened. This year, the type got really small. I know. So, <laughs> I don't know it's what like, I'm doing. It's your birthday. Yeah, right. It's my birthday, <laughs> and I can't see. But just happy uh, to be back and on the best track that Dragon Con has. So. All right. Yeah. Uh, and hi, my name is Ian Harris. I, too, am a comedian. Also, my second year at DragonCon, thanks to we have again, two toddlers. I don't Derek know. and Margaret. We're two together. Uh, so, um, yeah, and I'm doing, I'm doing a show on Sunday night here at 10 o'clock. So, as well as, apparently, tonight. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, but yeah I'm, I'm, just a, I'm just just a comedian. Um, but I try to infuse skepticism. You're in, not just and, comedian. You also do voice talent, too. Yeah, I know. I do voiceover work, yes. But, um, but I don't do the cool voiceover work. I'm on my ride over here uh, last night from the airport. I was with the guy who does who uh, I, I know a uh, little, I mean, I met, but I know his name. And he's here because of his voiceover work, and he does all this cool, cool, st like... Uh, is he in a world guy? Is no, that he, guy? Do it, uh, when, you know, somebody who does like video games and animation, and he's like, what do you do? I'm like, uh, I, I, I just do like, you know, promos for <laughs> coming up next, Real Housewives. Uh, <laughs> and funny, like animation guys are like, oh, promo's awesome. I'm like, no, it's not, because nobody lines up to hear the guy who goes, bravo. Nobody gives a shit about the guy who says that. So, um, 
But yeah, so so that's it. Just uh, I love. I, I've been a skeptic since since the day I could pronounce the word skeptic, I guess. And uh, wow. and I love. I just uh, love science, and I love uh, skepticism, and I like to infuse it in my comedy, which usually means I have to argue with people after shows every show I go to. <laughs> so that's why I love being here because I don't get in arguments. I just get people who are interested in what I have to say. And so. you know, and total side plug. He, we were together at the Reason Rally. This dude is totally funny. You got I mean if you if that's what you're looking for, that that absolutely hilarious infusion of comedy and skepticism, this is your dude right here. Thanks. You want to see his show. Isn't it <laughs> online? Oh well I do have a I do have a, a TV special called um, Your Mic went out. Critical and oh, there you go. <laughs> I have a TV oh, special God. called what? Critical and Thinking um, that's on iTunes and Amazon and all those places you can watch it. And then I have a second one coming out that I'm taping in October that will be for Netflix called Extraordinary. So. And then we have the late person. Is a late person? No, without a mic. Introduce yourself. <laughs> I have no mic and no water. I'm <laughs> And the oh, proverbial... you, this is what you get when you're late. I am, I'm playing the wandering Jew today, so I've been exploring Atlanta and the Uber and the various hotels here. Uh, my name is Rob Penzak. I'm the executive director of Atheist Alliance of America. I co-produce and host a show called Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. Um, I was a physician turned writer turned secular activist, so my wife did not use very good critical thinking skills in picking a mate. Um, and you know, this is something I'm really glad to be. It's really exciting that they have a skeptics track down here. I also write fantasy, so this is really a perfect blend. Um, you know, I couldn't be more excited about coming to Dragon Con and hopefully getting some of the critical thinking ideas out into the mainstream as well. Thank you so much <laughs> for that. I'll try not to gasp as we get on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Angie. All right, so. I got to throw in one more thing because everybody else was talking about the thing that they're going to do while they're here and I forgot to mention I'm also going to be giving a presentation on the taxonomy of dragons <laughs> tomorrow I think 2, 2.30, probably here. How many gra dragon fossils have they found by now? <laughs> That's debatable. <laughs> <laughs> but are any of them on the, uh, on the ark? <laughs> they, uh, they should be. Well, uh, on there, the Ken Ham Ark. Are there any New Testament dragons? Because I think, you know, for people who are progressive. I was on the Ark, and I did see some dragons that Ken Ham had created specifically for that. Uh, <laughs> he called them velociraptors, but he also called them dragons. Awesome. Mm. Velociraptors. Those are one of the things about, like, a little bit shy of a chicken size thing. Or did he use the Jurassic Park movie version? the Jurassic Park movie version, oh, and, I, yeah. and I, I called to their attention, I grabbed one of the people that worked there, and I said, where's its feathers? Uh -huh. yeah. That's right. Almost, almost all. <laughs> but let's, let, let's be fair, the early people from, from 5,000 years ago had to get around somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yabba dabba doo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw the cartoon, it's plausible. All right, so. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's your birthday, but I mean. <laughs> Just vodka. So, what, we'll start on this end. What is the most pressing, pressing issue for skeptics you think is going on now? I mean, a few years ago, it was always the Dover trial and things like that. What do you think is the thing now? Um, you know, I guess I would say that the main reason I'm in this is for you know, a lot of, a lot of socio-political issues and also just things that are gonna shape our future. Um, without a, a good understanding of science amongst our politicians and our media, things like global warming, which I think is a real threat, um, has been passed over for literally 20 years. So, you know, that, that's one specific issue, but really just getting people to take an open look. Another thing that we're gonna be talking about here is street epistemology, where we try to have honest conversations about contentious issues where you don't necessarily agree with the people on the other side. So you know, I'd say there's, on a broad scale, our biggest issue is not being able to have those honest conversations. We've become so polarized and people shut down very quickly and don't wanna listen to the other side and see if maybe they're wrong about something. And then you know, for a specific topic, I would say that you know, critical thinking in science needs to get into our political mainstream. Yeah, and I, I have to add to that what he was talking about, you know, the 
science being rejected uh, by political officials. I mean, when you have people that say that we don't need to do anything about climate change, I mean, regardless whether you accept global warming or not, even if you just look at it as an environmental issue and how much damage we've been doing to the environment since, you know, what, the 50s, right? I mean, this is, you know, there's cumulative garbage. Who can deny all of this? I mean, some, it takes some accountability. But when people say things like the seas can't be rising, because God promised never to flood the world again. <laughs> That's not a person we need to vote for. That's yeah. somebody that needs to be put in a special room and educated. Yeah, when he said that, that was actually a politician who said that. Yes. It, just like the guy with the snowball. There can't be global warming because I found this snowball. There. So this is, these are the people we're electing <laughs> for their leadership skills. This is a problem. The worst part is uh, I watched Cosmos as a kid, and when the whole you know, the Al Gore movie came out. It's like I watched this. Like I saw this episode of Cosmos like 20 years ago, and so we've know we've known this for this long, and now people are paying attention finally. Yeah, and and, and now now our vice presidential uh, candidate Mike Pence wants yeah. to wants to teach evolution as just a theory. Yeah, didn't we try this like a while back with the? Yeah, Papa Bush. <laughs> I think his running mate can trump that. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a meal with Trump before. I have stories. Uh, next. <laughs> All right, so for me, a pressing issue is to try to change academic and scientific culture um, in the following way. So as scientists, we are uh, rewarded to do primary research, to find out how the world works. But we're not rewarded to communicate uh, with the public. Some of us do it. We're encouraged to do it by uh, universities, by uh, founding agent funding agencies. But th there are no rewards within the system, and I think that's a big problem. Uh, it's a problem because there needs to be many, many, many more scientists, academics, professors out there uh, pushing the cause, explaining science to the public, uh, writing for the public. So that's something that's become very urgent uh, for me because I've been in the ivory tower for all my life, essentially, and I've stepped out recently and now I'm at events like this one, and I'm realizing how few people in my profession, you have the well-known ones, of course, the Richard Dawkins, the Steven Pinkers, but they are far fewer than you would imagine who actually do things like that, again, because they're not rewarded. Uh, once many more of us come out and start doing things like that, I think that's a way to put pressure on uh, political bodies um, to engage the public, to engage students. I have students uh, who you mentioned evolution, so I have a story about this. I had a, a science major who once came to me after a lecture and told me he did not believe in evolution, at least in human evolution, because nobody was around to see it happen. <laughs> And so he explained to me, he said, you see, Professor, science uh, is something that we can recreate in the lab. If nobody was around to see it happen, it didn't happen. So I was tempted to tell him that uh, nobody was around to see his parents have sex, but we could reliably infer from his presence <laughs> uh, in the room that this somehow must have happened. I mean, just think about this for a second. This guy was graduating from college with a science degree, and that's the kind of argument that he was pushing. Um, so uh, that's, in fact, there's, um, I'm going to do a plug for the Free Thought Society. There's a oh. little uh, blurb that I wrote. Uh, you can pick it up in the back. Uh, it's called The Curse of the Carl Sagan Effect uh, that discusses this uh, issue that I think is very pressing. The worst part is we actually have seen evolution in action in experiments and actually in recent times. Of course, it's with things that multiply fast, like insects. Like, because of World War II, we actually now have a new mosquito because all the people who went underground during the bombings in London, there's now a mosquito that doesn't bleed with the other ones and can only be underground. And it originally was up, up above the subways, but now it only lives down in the subway and it can only breed with itself. So we've, I've seen this stuff happen. So technically, we actually haven't seen it. So we have that to tell them next time. Yeah, right. <laughs> there are many other things I wish I could have told them. But. Yeah, my, my book also has examples of observed instances of yeah. speciation, as well as beneficial mutations and transitional species and that sort of thing. 
and um, I guess it's my turn. So I want to encourage people to go to the back of the room and um, pick up complimentary literature from the Free Thought Society. And we do publish some very interesting articles, one of which is Julian's article about the Carl Sagan effect. And it's beautifully, beautifully written. Uh, you'll enjoy it very much. Uh, my main focus in the non-theist community has always been about discrimination. And it has always been a passion of mine to end discrimination against the non-theist community. And that involves the skeptics as well. Um, and that's why I took on the project of the parade, was to get out there in the public eye and show that we have a sense of humor, show that we have a love of history and science, and, and get the persona changed publicly as much as possible. In the non-theist community, we have that same problem with uh, negative stereotyping. So that's been my main focus for the last 30 years, is trying to end the negative stereotyping, end the myths about non-theism, and present a very good public um, persona, uh, to promote speakers who have great qualities, to promote comedians who have great messages, and, and to get as many people out there in the public to, to change the perception. And I hope you'll join me on Saturday because... There goes the pitch. The pitch. <laughs> and um, I would really, really appreciate um, people joining in. And she gives you costumes, so if you don't have one. That's kind of, that's her thing. <laughs> so, dance so next. OK, so the coffee is just starting to take effect here. <laughs> mm. This is my religion. Um, so what's the most pressing issue? At the Freedom from Religion Foundation, we have seven full-time attorneys and a legal staff. We have a whole second floor for legal. And they're very busy. We have at least a dozen cases in the courts at every le level from counties to high schools to the um, federal level. I'm suing the chaplain of the U.S. House of Representatives right now because he won't let me give a secular invocation. Uh, uh, but so petty. We, so we also do, you know, I kind of thought that the House of Representatives should be representative. Yeah, but, you, you know, you would think. <laughs> but in any event, uh, and we're doing it not on free speech but on uh, equal protection. Uh, and, uh, but in addition to the lawsuits, we field thousands of complaints from people around the country. Maybe some of you have sent complaints. Last year, more than 4,000 complaints came in. This year, it's probably going to be about 5,000. And the plurality, the largest complaint we get is religion in the schools. Mm -hmm. They're going after the kids, the Gideon Society, uh, preaching teachers, uh, preachers coming in during lunchtime. <clears throat> we got a preacher kicked out of a Texas school just this last week because he's coming in. And the school said, fine, you can come in and do that. But, you know, they don't let anybody walk into the schools unless they've got a Bible. These are predators, really, is what they are. Um, uh, creationism in the, in the classroom, uh, preaching teachers and so on. Ten Commandments monuments on a on a high school property on two high school properties, which we've had to sue over, and we won one, and we're going to be winning the next one pretty soon. So it's the schools really, and I think the theme here is that the education of reason, science, skepticism, doubt, open mind is really what's the hope for the future. And the religious right wants to squelch that. They want to get the kids and keep them thinking, you know, that the Bible is the truth. So. Uh, we complained, we sent letters to all the school districts around the Ark Park uh, in northern Kentucky to those four states. Every single school district we sent a letter saying you cannot use the Ark Park as a field trip for your kids. A lot of the schools are, gonna, are trying to do that. They're saying, oh good, let's use this as a historical field trip to explain something because the Bible's a part of our history. They have somebody riding a dinosaur. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, they, they can go on their own, and churches can do that, but the public schools cannot be doing that. Public schools should educate, so we're trying to clamp down on that and, and warn the schools they could be legally liable if they do something like this. So. And it, it, it speaks of an endorsement that, you know, it's something that worthwhile to go it visit. Does. And that's... But they're just saying, oh, well, that's a part of American history, and, and we're saying, well, you could theoretically, if you were doing a class on... Uh, kind of 
wacko Americana movements, <laughs> and you were going around visiting the snake handlers. It, you could probably pull that out. Okay, now we're going to go to the Ark Park. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, but they're presenting it like it's a historical fact, and that's just wrong. So. Comparative wacky teaching. Wacky and if, teaching. And if somebody <laughs> thinks that this is like a little fringy, think about Scientology. This it was a book written by a very bad sci-fi author <laughs> as a legitimate bet, and people now see it as an actual religion. Yeah. Go figure. That's, so it, That's why I'm working on another book, because that's profitable. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Just saying. The origin of comedy. So the goddess Leanne, huh? is that what it's going to be? Listen, people, people want to be led. You might as well lead them. I'll donate. And you got the last name for it. I do. I do. <laughs> it's actually very scary. People would invite me to do shows at churches because of my last name. And like, mm. oh. <laughs> no, you should say yes. <laughs> that's, I'm that's an altar call they don't want. <laughs> I mean, that's a good idea. <laughs> Kill them with, you know, uh, humor. Yes. Um, what was the question? It's my birthday. No. <laughs> <laughs> you have I, birthday I, brain. I do. I really do. Well, you know, it, it, it's once a year, and, you know, this is the kickoff of the fiscal quarter, so, you know, you can get it all in. Um, for me, I mean, all the things that you all have mentioned are, are very important. The, the one that is, I guess, always standing for me is the hyper-religiosity of the black community. Um, I was part of a campaign, uh, CFI, Center for Inquiry, did a campaign a few years ago, a few years ago called African Americans for Humanism. And the goal of the program was simply to say, you are not alone. If you have doubts about religion, this wasn't you know, us running in the churches, pulling people out, but letting people be comfortable with the idea that you are not alone in having doubts about the religion that you are practicing and that you should be skeptical, you should be asking questions. I mean, I was raised Catholic, which kind of explains how I got here. Yeah, I mean, uh, my, most. I mean, yeah, that's the, we all know that's sort of the gateway <laughs> uh, for us. But I'm a, I'm a minority within a minority, you know, with, overwhelmingly, um, mo most of the black community will be some form of Baptist or Pentecostal or other type of Christianity. Uh, and it is very difficult to have those questions. It's difficult to leave. It's difficult to not sort of engage in the magical thinking that, you know, some sky daddy's gonna fix things for us. Um, and just being out uh, and being a nice person. You know, I, I, I was, I used to be very argumentative and combative. I'm older, I'm tired now. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to be a decent human being. And that decency and the non-belief, I'm hoping is enough of an ambassadorship where people can go, oh, you know, oh, well, she's nice and she's also a non-believer. You know, I would like to think those little things, which aren't so little, matter. So the bigger this can become, the more normalized that we can be. Uh, the more people can understand that they don't necessarily have the right to inflict their beliefs on others, uh, I think helps my community, uh, both the African American community and overwhelmingly the female African American community because by and large churches are packed with women and I, I'd like to think we're, we're stronger and smarter than that. So. And, and going over to Julian's point, who do you work with quite often? Oh yes, um, I am a one of uh, the co-hosts of Star Talk with uh, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is just the poster boy for logic and coolness and <laughs> sciences awesome. Uh, I Full disclosure, I'm not there for my science background. I guess I'm the resident sci-fi nerd. Uh, we, his co-hosts often serve as the, as the everyman. So when he gets too techy and I'm like, mm, you know, by my face he can tell we need an easier, simpler explanation. And the whole goal of Star Talk 
is to sort of have that combination or, or that meeting of pop culture and science so that you are subtly teaching while entertaining. Uh, he will tell you that this isn't, kids, uh, there are children who are fans of the show, his goal are, is adults. Uh, those of us who sort of missed science or, or didn't have that encouragement in science and math, and I, I will fully raise my hand and go, there's stuff I don't know. And not that I'm comfortable not knowing, what I am comfortable is asking the questions and admitting I don't know and being open to those explanations from folks who do know, like Neil. He is very um, not elitist when it comes to education. That's where we get into trouble, where we try to hold that knowledge and hoard it, and the folks who need to know then don't know, and we have schisms and election years like this. So, sorry, I had to get that in. No, Leanne, <laughs> Leanne, do you do both the um, podcast and the? Uh, I do the podcast. Uh, I, they usually bring me in for a segment called Cosmic Queries or Science After Dark, uh, where the, uh, the fans and, 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 and folks write in and ask Neil questions, and I read the questions. Neil does not know the questions and has to answer them on the spot, which is so awesome, because usually I don't even understand the questions. <laughs> what, am I, what am I saying? And then we're also on Nat Geo. We moved to Nat Geo last year. Um, we got renewed for a second season before our first season started. We were nominated for an Emmy for our first season, and I just taped, uh, we just taped, um, our, started taping our second season back in March. So and you can see that on Nat Geo. I think it is the only late night science pop culture talk show in the history of and, ever. And Nat Geo is National Geographic yeah, Channel. Yes, National Geographic. You, you, uh, Mark you're is, speaking. is our publicist for the show, <laughs> uh, who reminds me to say these things. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I think I've covered, do, are there, are there, are there I think, I, think, I think people know who you are now. Is it your birthday, though? It's a, <laughs> today's, my, today's my birthday. But just, by all means, don't feel limited by the 24-hour structure uh, of the confines <laughs> of the calendar. Don't limit yourselves yeah, that way in any way. Especially because the vendor's hall is way yeah, over yeah. at the America Mart. Yes, so yes, it might take gosh. you like a day or two to bring her right, gift or whatever. Right? Yeah. just saying a girl needs a bat left. So... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, me. Um, <laughs> How'd you get into all that? Well, I, I think like, everything has already been said. You know, I don't have, I wouldn't say like I have one specific um, thing other than, which has already kind of been said. I, I, I feel that all the issues that we continually talk about stem from the same, same basic thing, and that's that people don't know how to think, and people don't know how to evaluate good evidence and where to get good evidence from. So I, I find that there's this two kinds of things going on in, in America, especially one where it's, it's cool to flaunt your ignorance in some groups, where yeah, being ignorant is like, a, or being you know, uh, against uh, science or, or, or reason is, is somehow a virtue. And, and on the other hand, I think that I have, I have friends that are, they've kind of got the idea, like that they're, they're, they're kind of, they're questioning things and all that, but they don't really know, they've never been taught how to evaluate evidence, how to, how to uh, where to get, what's a good source, what's a, you know, so anything, so all of a sudden they become these conspiracy theorists where they're, on one hand they're shedding something, uh, they're shedding some ridiculous belief, but they're replacing it with some other ridiculous belief because they're, they're never, uh, they're, just, they're just going from one thing to the next because they're, they're, they're not really being taught how to, or have never been taught how to think critically, and I think, um, uh, that's something that uh, I don't know where it starts. I guess I guess at a, a, a very young age, but um, but that's it's, that's just part of our, our culture. I mean, I find I find teachers. My my wife used to be a science teacher, and and I find teachers now. Even my daughter had to actually one of my daughters. Uh, she's in sixth grade. One of her words, her vocabulary words, she just started school two weeks ago, was skepticism. Cool. And the, but the teacher didn't know how to pronounce it, and my daughter was like. It's uh, skepticism, and, uh, <laughs> and I was like, "Wow, when your when when your middle school teacher doesn't even know how to pronounce the word skepticism, maybe she's That's not using." Skepticism. What did she say? What's that? She was like, "And so here's a skeptic. Skept, skept, she she knew what the word was, but she just hadn't said it enough to. She was, it's skeptic skeptic. And my daughter just goes, "Skepticism, yes, skepticism." <laughs> so, but it's I just think you raised know, her well. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. Uh, 
<laughs> but yeah, so I just I think I think that's the, the biggest thing is getting people to think and getting people to to um, you, you know to think uh, properly and to, and to check their check their resources and actually check their check their sources because the greatest thing about uh, the internet is also its downfalls that there's so much information out there that there's also so much misinformation out there's there. There's actually a benefit in the fact that the internet is rife with idiocy and, <laughs> and, and stupidity and ponies. Like when, you, when you're looking at news stories, I mean, how many times have you like shared a news story and then turned out that, that it was faux news, right? Yeah. Not just yes. Fox yeah. News, but completely made up, <laughs> right? So I mean, there's a lot Sometimes of- Sometimes both. There, there's a lot of news stories that are that not just the onion, but I mean, just people just coming up with just fake stuff. That, you know, so you have to be skeptical about everything that you read, and I think there's an advantage to that because I was raised to believe that if you if it showed up in a newspaper or it was on TV, that's true. That's what you. That's how you verify whether it's true is it showed up on TV, right? Because there's I, because I'm thinking that there's somebody out there vetting this information, right? <laughs> but now we know better. Now we know that everything I share, at least everything I share, I don't know about you, but with everything I share on Facebook, somebody's going to come back and say that didn't really happen. <laughs> oh, okay, fine. So now I have to I have to verify everything before and you know, I. Don't don't really believe this. I'm just sharing right. this. Don't. <laughs> well, you know that there's also this thing nowadays where <clears throat> I always tell people, I go, people say, yeah, I, I read this. Uh, I read this study that such and such happened, and I go, no, that's called a meme. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> because you saw a, a word, a couple of words over a picture, that's not a study. But that, but that, <laughs> it's the same thing as I, I see so I see so many people that they'll 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 post. To, actually, there's actually a, a couple of funny. Meet articles, somebody. articles where the whole article is to prove that you, that you only read, read the, uh, the headline. Right. <clears throat> but I see that over and over and over where people just l comment on something or, or post something on the internet because of the headline. Yeah. And then you, they didn't actually read the story. Right. Mm -hmm. That happens over and over and over. And people take the headline and they walk away going, did you hear that this happened? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's like, well, if you read the story, you'd realize that that was just a, uh, yeah. uh, was a clickbait. clickbait, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Happens well, all the well, time. I, you don't, what we don't do is verify or vet those stories that we agree with. Like, if you already agree with it, well, then it must be true. And then we only expend the energy in the stuff that we disagree with. You know, like we can, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, I got that. And so we, you also have to, I, I, there's a word for that, the uh, cognitive bi confirmation, confirmation bias. bias, which uh, very smart, educated people <laughs> fall for all the time. So we have to be uh, vigilant without being arrogant. And remember that you know while you're getting down on someone else for not knowing, where's your blind side, yeah. as well. So there there has to be some cognitive compassion, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know if that's a, that's a good well, one. Well, several people mentioned education as being uh, something that we have to stress, and um, the. Saturday parade is going to be so unique. <laughs> um, first of all, it is the first time we are going to be on national television, folks. This is a nationally, uh, it's going to be filmed on the CW, and it's going to be, you know, aired to millions of people, not just the 80,000 people that show up on the streets of Atlanta. And we are going to have an Einstein. Ian's going to be our <laughs> Albert Einstein. Leanne Lord is going to be Ida, Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells. <laughs> Dan Barker is going to be Lucian. And Julian is going to be Thomas Paine. Yes. I'm going to be Alice Paul, the suffragist. And we're going to have a... We she also wanted to be Ida B. Wells, but I'm like, uh, I don't know yeah. if we get it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Aaron is going to be a... Sec, uh, a, a skeptic sheriff, um, and he's gonna. And the sign says, "On the lookout for flim flammers." <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and we have these great signs, and almost every sign has the word "skeptic" in it, or skepticism, or something about you know rational thinking. So we've got a great opportunity for many people <laughs> to join us at with loner costumes and be a part of this educational event. I, I'd like to, can, can I mention something? You said something very important, um, but at uh, the higher uh, ivory tower academic level, and I think that I wish we could filter that down even earlier because religious folks get it. You know, the younger you get them, you know, the, you're able to keep them. Right. So I wish those rewards were in place sooner, uh -huh. that critical thinking skills were taught 
to children much younger, and so that it was sort of baked in. So that it, 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 we might even be able to do puberty better, my goodness, <laughs> if we had those sorts of questioning, yeah. uh, critical thinking skills in uh -huh. there. Um, but it seems like we're, like you said, we're rewarded for not knowing and not asking and yeah. flaunting our, our ignorance and, you know, just... It's because it's not fun. There's no magic yeah. in it. When you're a kid, magic is fun. But knowledge, <laughs> knowledge is fun, too, yeah. uh, says I, the nerd. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I agree. It would be wonderful to be able to start younger. The problem, I think, is that uh, there's a big difference between the kinds of thoughts that we engage when we think about religious notions mm -hmm. and the kind of thoughts that we engage when we do science, the first one, it turns out, is very natural. We are creatures that were, I'm not going to say designed, but that evolved with certain psychological uh, profiles that make religion or religion thought very natural. Science, by contrast, is very unnatural. It takes years of training to think scientifically. That's why, back to what we were saying earlier, it doesn't come naturally. And so we have this problem to begin with. Uh, and so I think that education is a huge, huge uh, factor and very, very important to combat the natural. Uh, and in, in a way, we are the odd ones out. Uh, scientists are odd because they don't think like most people. They really are taught to think differently for many, 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 many years. Um, and so trying younger, I think, would be a very good idea. Yeah, we're, we're, comedians are also the odd people out. So the, the science kids and the comedian kids are sitting at the same table in the lunchroom, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's really important that skeptics break out of their own community and get into shifting mainstream culture. You know, a lot of things that we've talked about, um, you know, like Arn goes and fact checks everything, and if we're in the skeptical community, that's what we do. And we feel really embarrassed if we jump on a story because it sort of favored our side and we throw it out there. I don't think most of mainstream America and mainstream media doesn't have that sense of shame or I screwed up or I really should have looked into this. And we really need to inculcate that, you know, in education early, that it's your obligation as you put out information to do the fact, the fact checking, um, <clears throat> I think with childhood indoctrination is another thing that I'd love to see us, you know, really address head on and keep it in the media or get it in the media. You know, people like you know, Richard Dawkins, Andy Thompson, a lot of people will say that that really is child abuse. And the same way you can't feed lead paint to a kid, if we're really harming a kid's per, you know thought process, and if they're not going to develop the same way cognitively when they're 20 because of how they're educated from two to seven, there's really a case to be made that we owe them critical thinking so they can reach their full potential. Is there a case for that? Does anybody, anybody here know what the Flynn effect is? The Flynn effect? Yeah, it's been going on for since they've been studying this, where no matter what, the IQ level of, of people have been getting keeps going up and up and up, and one of the biggest reasons they believe this is happening is because of the fact that more and more people are having to use logic and critical thinking just to survive today over the time where when inventions started to happen, the tools got more complex, the things you have to do for work became more complex, so it started to actually, the, the parts of your brain had to work different and therefore people's IQ keeps going up and it's actually a studied thing. So there's a case to be made for the fact that if you dampen that, <laughs> it's proven that people get smarter if you don't let that happen. If you let people flourish, they actually get a lot smarter, and it's been shown. So. It has indeed, yes. That's a real effect. Uh, and what's interesting is that it's only a subpart. IQ is, measures different things. There's one thing it measures that's called analytical thinking, and that's the thing that keeps getting better. Uh, and it's been linked to uh, more and more complex societies, our use of technology, et cetera, et cetera. Even in the U.S., it's happened. So I think, <laughs> I think, there's, uh, wow. I think there's hope. I think there's hope. Uh, how can we, Italian, aren't you? How can we spread it to politics? <laughs> you're Italian, aren't you? <laughs> Is Texas in the U.S.? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> we got six minutes left. If we have time for like one question, how this works is you walk up to the microphone, don't touch it, it'll actually Explosive. adjust your height. It's automatic, it's magic. Really? Wow. Yes. Woo. Wow. Come on, somebody's gotta try it. Come on. Yeah. First one. And we have one minute each then, that's good. Adjust. Okay. Oh. Wow. Oh. wow. Oh. Just, just, yeah, say sweet speech. <laughs> Top 30. And who says there's no sense? Someone, someone, you know what, yeah. Magic. Yeah, have someone record this and then tell a story that the mic, you know, something happened, a miracle happened. On this God must have done it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but then which one? <clears throat> True. Okay, so uh, my question is actually brief. Um, so, what do we do? 
about, because we spoke a lot about educating children and making sure that we can combat indoctrination. Um, what is it that we can do at the school level to teach children about the sciences and keep them from being taught creationism, rather, in the schools, in public schools? Um, because I come from Cleveland, Ohio. Ohio is quite creationist. <laughs> And me coming from the inner city, there was not one word about evolution. There was not one word about cosmology. There was not one word about the age of the earth, things of that nature. And what is it that we can do in terms of talking to, let's say, school districts about making sure that we can at least introduce science into the classroom from a very early stage, you know, let's say kindergarten all the way up to high school? What is it that we can do about that? Well, uh, unfortunately, there's no one here representing the Richard Dawkins Foundation, but they have a program where they're going out to school districts and teaching teachers how to teach evolution. And it's you know going into the mostly southern states right now is to make sure that the teachers really? have the tools that they need to promote evolution. And I have to credit you know the Richard Dawkins Foundation for coming up with this idea. Look it up on the internet under his website, and I, that will verify what I'm saying. And when you do, <laughs> you're going to see the video series that Richard Dawkins Foundation is hosting that my wife and I make to teach middle school biology, which includes unapologetically uh, evolution wherever it is integrated in the national standards what is required by students. Yeah, I want to say another word about that program. Uh, so that's the TIES program, if you look it up by Bertha Vasquez. I think he approached the Dawkins Foundation um, and that, you know, that's a, it is a wonderful project. I think we're hoping actually at Atheist Alliance to talk with her a little bit and figure out how to incorporate some of her insights as we start trying to teach critical thinking, street epistemology. The one other thing I say we can do is I would love to see many of our top scientists come out. I don't think anybody has, you know, most mainstream America doesn't realize that, you know, 97% or some huge amount of our scientists are atheists and skeptics and critical thinkers. We really need to change. So if they all came out in mass and said, science is how we know all these things, here, criti um, you know, global warming is a real threat right now. Um, the fact that we don't have new antibiotics coming online is a problem, you know, how capitalism can become a problem. If scientists came out in mass and made that kind of statement, it might let the educators actually do their job. I know right now, uh, you know, middle school teachers, high school teachers face such political pressure not to do their actual teaching. Next up. All right, my question is specifically for Dan. Um, I was had a question about the anonymity of like making claims before the freedom of religion. Um, Backstory: Like my daughter's elementary school has a bu billboard every like around Thanksgiving, Christmas for it says respect for the Creator. And while I'm getting more open with my atheism, I'm still nervous about discrimination um, for her mainly in the school. If you know, it was to be known that making a claim against it. Yeah, we can do that anonymously. We, as long as we have a complaint, we can say we have heard from someone in either in your district or in the, a student or a parent and keep your name out of it. It can, it can get really dangerous. We're complaining in Indiana and they want to cut up the plaintiffs and throw them in the river, they said. I mean, they're really angry. So you you probably want to keep your head down, but... That's so Christian-like. Christian yes, yeah, it's, well, it's about that love and compassion thing Christian, I hear yes. about. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, no, it's because of the fish symbol, you know, the fish in the oh. river, get it? They, so, but um, one of our attorneys was actually threatened. So <clears throat> uh, you can let us know. We have to keep it anonymous. And uh, it's a very brave family who wants to come out publicly. Uh, some families that we, some families had to actually leave town when it, when it became known. Also, you can go to court on a protective order. You can get, uh, you can go anonymously too, which means the judge knows, but nobody else does. We could also do public ridicule. I mean, if somebody wants to take a picture of this banner, then somebody else might so, blog about it. So let it. us know the facts, because that should <laughs> yes. come down. If it's, if it's in the school, by the school, they're, but, break, they're but breaking they, the law. You need some evidence, though. You know, you, <clears throat> pictures would be helpful. Um, supply the name of the school district. You know, make make notes of how, you know how how long it's up. It's only up for like a week, a week and a half. So that's Give dates. The the more the more information you can provide to the Freedom from Religion Foundation, the more substantiated the complaint looks. 
We yeah. have a form, an online form. You can click, 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 and it really helps uh, because thousands of them come in. And we have one guy who spends his whole day just handling intake wow. to know which attorney to get it to and how, which. And many of them are so similar, we have template letters ready to go. We can use to get a letter out that day. We can get it sent and mailed and get it and emailed and get to the media in the area too, so. And death threats are real. When I was um, in a lawsuit to, to get the Ten Commandments plaque down from the Chester County Courthouse, I had death threats every day. And they were scary, you know. And did, they, did you remind me that one of those commandments actually, so did, I'm just wondering. <laughs> it says something about that somewhere. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, one of the, yeah. I think we got 30 seconds, but you know what? One person left, so you get that last question, then your last one. No it. pressure. That'd be good. <laughs> I go to a church where we actually, uh, want, I want to teach critical thinking to, to the children as part of their religious education. I haven't been able to find any curriculum. I found one book, um, children's book, where there's a little girl trying to debunk a ghost story. That's my book. Well, thank you. <laughs> Scooby Doo works pretty well. Scooby Doo is fantastic. Old Scooby Doo, not the movies. How old are the children that you're trying to teach? Well, they're all all ages. Starting. Um, I would probably be working with the um, kids from the fifth through the, you know, high school. Mm -hmm. I also would like to be able to do it with adults in my church with critical thinking and or analytical thinking. I, I don't have I don't have any con curriculum for that either. I can I'm happy to suggest some. So Skeptic Magazine, for example, mm -hmm. uh, has a junior skeptic section at the end, which is very good. Uh, they're also uh, they're on my mind because I just wrote a blurb for them. But uh, Guy Harrison has. Um, you can, we can talk after this if you'd like, but has a couple of books on just that. Uh, the, his latest one is called Good Thinking. It's written for the general public. Uh, children, high schoolers could probably use it too. It's very, very good. Are there it, pictures? I'm writing this uh, I, No, I don't think there are pictures. No. Uh, actually, uh, on that note, almost all the books that Guy Harrison has done actually kind of speak to the things that you would be worried exactly. about. Because yeah. he writes books that are kind of aimed at the general mm -hmm. population. Yep. I, actually, most of the books do. Yeah, so th those would be good. Um, yeah. But if you, I mean, we can talk if you'd like. If you contact me, I can send you all, all kinds. There are articles that are written for the general public. There. I'd like to be included in that conversation. Yeah, I absolutely. Think, I think there's a project that needs to be done. Yeah, and, and so, I, okay. I also have a few ideas for events that teach critical thinking skills. <laughs> you already took mine. A parade. The parade. The parade. parade. <laughs> I think you got that right. Um, okay, on the, on the note where somebody mentioned that, you know, if you want to talk a little bit afterwards, we're doing something a little bit different this year. When we're done with the panel, are all the guests are going to go out that door and then go to the Skeptics Meet and Greet area that's out near all the Skeptic Society table. There's actually a table there for it. There's a sign that says Meet and Greet. So you can actually go out there and talk all you want with any of the guests you want. Music